Hello and welcome to my podcast. Do me a favor, subscribe to the John Conn Report wherever you get your podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. You can find us there as part of Empire Media, that's A-M-P-I-R-E. And of course, you can always read my work on ESPN.com. Well, for, throughout the week, I'll, up, I'll update the news from, from the commander's facility. I'm also going to have a story later this week about Vince Lombardi's coaching one season in Washington. That, of course, is where he ended his career. You probably know that, but there are a lot of people who do not. So that's why we write the story. Anyway, some interesting stuff that I, in talking to various people, Larry Brown, Mike Bragg, Chris Hamburger, Mike Bass, and some conversations that I've had throughout the years. So look for that later this week. In a minute, I'll get to my conversation with former Washington tight end Chris Cooley. We talk about the quarterbacks, and we talk about them in part because of the news from today that Carson Wentz is undergoing surgery on Monday in Los Angeles to repair his fractured finger. We don't know yet the timeline, and we're not going to probably know that tonight. There is a fear for how long it could be because when quarterbacks fracture a finger, sometimes it can be up to six weeks. We don't know how long it's going to be, so I'm not reporting how long it may be because we don't know. The, what gives them some, what gives them pause with this is, first of all, they want to hear from the surgeon. Secondly, because it's the ring finger and not a an index finger or the middle finger, they're hoping that maybe it's not as long of a recovery period. So we will update that. We'll update this story for you throughout the week. That's where you go to ESPN.com. So. Or you can go to Twitter at John underscore Kime, but ESPN.com will have all the news as well. So I will get to now, by the way, Taylor Heineke will replace Wentz as a starter for however long he must he, that he would miss. People keep asking about Sam Howell. There's a gap between the two and there's a gap when you're trying to win games. You're not going to try and see what a guy can do. Not when you're two and four and the wild card is still sitting there, whether you think they can make it or not. So. Taylor Heineke will be the guy because, again, there is a gap. This is not about what fans need to see. This is about players and coaches needing and wanting to win. That's why they go to Heineke. Anyway, I'll get into all of that with Chris Cooley. We'll talk about, you know, about playing a guy in Howell's situation compared to a guy like Heineke, um, what he's thought of, what he thinks of Heineke, what he thinks, what he's thought of Carson Wentz this year, the offense in general. We get into some X's and O's with like hot routes and, you know, Scott Turner's offense. We talk about Ron Rivera for a minute. And if there's any hope, if he sees any hope when he watches these games, because he has been watching these games and also what he's up to these days. Anyway, that's it from me. And again, pay attention to ESPN.com the rest of the week for updates on this whole situation. And there you go. So let's get to my conversation with former Washington tight end, Chris Cooley. All right, Chris, before we get to the football stuff and, you know, Heineke, Wentz, all that good stuff, let people know what you've been up to. I know you've had a lot of projects again on your property. So what what's going on with Chris Cooley right now? <laughs> well, first of all, it's nice to actually watch football. I didn't watch football last year, and I actually missed everything this weekend because we took a trip through Yellowstone Park, which is beautiful this time of year. But yeah, we're building uh, we're building a new house. We live in a, as you can see, a log cabin that is nice, but it's like not exactly what we love. So I'm in the process of building a new house, and I'm sort of the contractor on it. I'm ab absolutely the contractor on it, and it's a lot. It's a lot of decisions. It's a lot of process. It's a lot of stuff, and seems to be every day for me right now. But I actually really enjoy it, Kim. And I know you do. This. We, I know you do, and, yeah. and and I like. I don't know if I'm divulging anything, but like the wrestling room that you're building for your son too. Yeah, we are in the process of building what is known here as a shop, which is a, essentially a large garage. If I say you know, we're building a shop first, it sounds crazy to most of my friends back in Virginia, Maryland, but everyone here has a shop. So it's a detached large garage, essentially. But we're building an upstairs to it where it fits a mat and a half for a wrestling room. There's just certain things, you know. And I don't know if this is everywhere with kids, and I would do anything for my kids. But it wrestling is is something my son's absolutely been in love with, even as a four-year-old last year. And 
it's hard to get them on a map whenever you want to get them on a map. Right. And you ask even a four or five year old to compete and win. And he, he wrestled in seven tournaments and he wanted to wrestle in more. It was over. He didn't understand why is wrestling over dad. <laughs> But you're asking them to go and, and wrestling is a, is not T-ball or Little League Baseball where everyone hits and everyone runs around the bases and they don't keep score. You win or you lose. And by the way, he's the, an incredibly sore loser, which we learned last year. We, we already knew a little bit, but he does not want to lose. And so we're going to we're going to build a wrestling room and, and then we can have his friends over and anyone over and wrestle whenever we want. And it's, it's part for us too, you know, in the process of building a new house, we talked about doing sort of a gym area and I hate having the gym in my house because then I never use it. <laughs> Maybe if I have to walk about a hundred, a hundred feet to where I have a shower and a room to do it, it's not my, my own home. I'll use it there. So multi, multifunctional time. There you go. How much of that competitiveness does he get from you? Were you like that? So I was absolutely like that. I hated to lose. I, <laughs> one of my favorite non-favorite moments about myself was my senior year in, 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 at Logan High School playing baseball. And I struck out, I think, for the second time. And I played center field. And I then proceeded to slam my bat and go get my glove. And I kicked it all the way to center field, which my mom told me she would never come and watch me play again if I ever did that. I don't know how my coach let me continue to play that game. I'm shocked at that. Full tantrum. That said, we played in a co-ed softball tournament about three weeks ago, and my wife struck out, and she slammed her bat and said some profanities. So I think it comes from both sides. <laughs> it usually does. Um, you're watching games again this year. Why not last year? Well, first of all, it's not any parent, I think, understands this. And last year, my kids were seven and four. And at this right. point, eight and five. And you do things on the weekends. Right. My daughter's in school. We try to do things on the weekends. Uh, Sunday's a great day to go skiing or in the fall to take the kids fishing or camping. And so last year, we were busy. It really had to do more with having young kids around. And for some reason, over the last couple Sundays, we've we had a birthday party at a friend's house where football was on all day. So the kids had their birthday party and, and we watched a couple games of football and we were at a cabin the week before camping and we had direct TV. So we watched football on Sunday, but it's, it's really actually enjoyable. I think I've talked about this with you before, yeah. but in calling the Washington games and playing, you never really see games. Right. And so it's fun to, to get a chance to watch some other games. I've watched you know, three of the Commanders games live, which hasn't been very much fun. <laughs> no. No. I'm wondering why I'm not watching like the Bills play or one of the better games of the week, but I seem to trend, tend to watch to watch Washington. Um, yeah, it's uh, it's just nice to to really have just a, a fan's interest in in what's going on in the NFL without anything pressing right and i know you go on kevin sheehan's show and talk about you know the commanders obviously and so i do want to ask about that and as we record this we don't have an update yet on carson wentz's finger how much time he'll miss we'll find this is monday morning we'll find that out probably monday night what's going on there but i do want to ask start there what have been your impressions of wentz thus far the first impression is that without immediate answers, I don't think he's comfortable in, in essentially solving the problem or finding solutions or getting through progressions. It, it's not been great as far as time in the pocket for Wentz either. And maybe some of that's on Wentz, maybe some of that's online, play calling. But Wentz has really struggled, in my opinion. Uh, one, getting the ball to his first read in in with some anticipation i think he needs to see his first read open more times than you'd like it to see it open instead of just letting the ball go it's all a lot of times it's an extra hitch and it's padding the ball a little bit too long 
And then two, because he's staying on that too long, I don't think he gets to two and three quick enough. And so he's struggling to get across the board through progressions. It's not that he hasn't done it. He's, he's done it. He's just not doing it on a regular basis. And, and, and that's, he's struggling a lot with that. And then two, he's been really inaccurate. And I think, even more so watching this last week's game and not watching it. Cause I've watched them all on the all 22 and right. on film. And some of that, you don't entirely see the McKissick four yards downfield and the velocity on some of the balls that he's right. throwing. Like I, I think the t- lack of touch to underneath throws with the inaccuracy makes them really, really tough to haul in. You know, when you get that ball coming 60 miles an hour at your knee, behind you 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 can get your hand on it and anyone can say man that's a that's a ball that could be caught it's just not a ball that gets caught often is that for some of that stuff is that trust familiarity with offense or do you think it's just him well i think a big part of the inaccuracy right now is him i'm not sure exactly what he's got to go through to fix that i i do think a being uncomfortable in the pocket is not aiding him at all in right. being able to make some of those throws as far as just relax and just get it to your guy. You know, the other thing you see with Carson and I, I was, I was a huge Carson Wentz fan in Philadelphia and I'm, I, I still like Carson Wentz. I, I do. I enjoy watching him play, but he was capable of moving in the pocket and making so many big plays off schedule and yeah. off script. In, in comparison almost to, to what Josh Allen does in yeah. Buffalo for a little bit in, in Philadelphia. And I mean, any, anyone that watched him play with, for the Eagles, even in DC was going, wow, this, this guy is a huge problem. And so because he was able to evade and get out of the pocket and make some of those big throws, I think maybe some of the issues were not seen with Carson Wentz. And right now, He's not capable of of moving and running and scrambling the way he was three years ago before the, some of the injury stuff. He's just not that guy. And I've also thought about that a lot with myself and watching not just Carson, but guys as they've evolved and changed in their careers. You don't always recognize that in yourself. It's tough to recognize. Your brain's telling you, this, this is me. This is the play I make. I know I can make this play. And I go back to the year after my knee surgery, thinking I was hauling ass or thinking I was making quick cuts and bursting out of things. And then you watch it on film. And even even then, it's still you. So you kind of give yourself the benefit of the doubt. But you don't have that full realization that I'm not that fast uh, or I'm not that quick because you used to be in your mind sees it that way. And I think that probably some of Carson's problem is is maybe – that in a little bit that when he starts to move right or left or like there was a for instance he was run down in the Tennessee game and I'm terrible with names and I should be better but 98's a, a stud I, I get it oh. yeah Simmons is a stud but three years ago Carson Wentz would outrun Simmons to the sideline and, and Simmons hawked Carson Wentz down really from from behind and you look at that and say well I'm sure he's saying, did he seriously just get right. that guy really fast, I guess. But it's it's not. It's that he's not as fast. So hey, I, I, go ahead, Cam. No, no. I, mean, I was going to ask you about that, about the limit limitations. Like to me, his mo- immobility has limited the offense, given the problems in protection. And that's where, like, when you look at a guy like Heineke, could he give a jump start just because of that? Yeah, I think the answer, and I think you're going to see it this week, is yes. And I don't want to sit here and, and say Heineke is a better quarterback than Carson Wentz. Right. I think that Carson Wentz, even right now, does have more upside. And mm-hmm. and a lot of that is, does Carson Wentz continue to work and fit in with the team the way he's supposed to and not some of the things that happen in Philadelphia? And I mean, take out all the extracurriculars, which is not right. really fair. Uh, I think Carson does still have more upside, and I think he has the ability to evolve and a, bit, a bigger arm and can make some different throws. But right now, what Washington really needs is to get the ball in the hands of some of these receivers earlier so they can make plays. 
And, and that's what Heineke is going to be able to do a little bit. And then Heineke can absolutely evade and move to some of the pressures that they're going to have. I don't, it's not like Steve Young's coming in for Joe Montana here. Right. But, but just so we're, we're clear on it. Yeah. But it, it, to some extent, it might be more like Todd Collins is coming in for Jason Campbell. Hmm. I don't know if that, it doesn't make them a, a go out and win every game team. And, and now you're a playoff team. And it just, I think it gives them, you know, an early boost to what they can do. And also Heineke is going to be very familiar with this offense. And it was Wentz's first offense that was not a Andy Reed type offense in his career. So he, he had to learn a lot as well. And there's a huge learning curve. I've seen that. I had a lot of different quarterbacks and I saw it with all of them and it's at least a a better part of a season before most of the guys I was around really started to feel comfortable with their anticipation of the offense. So yeah, I think Heineke will probably come in and and give a little boost. I would, I would bet that, but you're also saying, is he going to throw more for more than 90 yards against the bears? That that's, I mean, Carson had a couple bad outings. Yeah, I don't. I don't see them going away from Carson Wentz if he's healthy, or if there's a chance for Carson to play. I think they'll stick with Carson. I think if they can fix the finger, tape it. Uh, you know, there's so many different ways you can break your finger, have some of those injuries. Like I remember I shattered my finger, and it was the year I hurt my knee. Mm-hmm. Or my knee was bad, and we used the the, the finger, and I had surgery as a real excuse to essentially go on the. Uh, I are for the end of the year, but I was really told when they put all the screws in my finger, it was potentially one game to miss. Oh, okay. So and, it, it how how they fix it and what is I don't I don't know I haven't yeah we don't know yet uh, doctor but sometimes fingers are not six week injuries right and we don't know yet I know there was a fear of that but until we know for sure we just I'm not I don't know. But I do, you know, if Heineke has to go in, then I wanted to address him. Um, and what have you thought of him as a passer? I mean, the way they considered him always was high-end backup, low-end starter. What have you thought of him in the past? I would say high-end backup, low-end starter. And in that, you get a guy that can give you a boost, who knows the offense, knows the system. But I don't think – when you say low-end starter, in at any point, you're talking about – a guy that you can survive a season with. Right. You're not talking about a guy that's going to lead you to a championship in most instances. So I think survive a season with Heineke is great. And more so, I mean, in that almost like the Todd Collins thing, you have a chance to make a run late and your starter goes down. He's going to give you a chance to win every game that you're right. in. I'm, he's not going to go win games for you more times than not. He's going to let you survive and have a chance to to win some ball games, and I think that's really what Heineke provides. You know, more times than not, week in week out, they'll give you a chance to, to win a ball game. The other thing that I, I would bet you is is going to be nice for you know Terry McLaurin and Curtis Samuel and Gibson and all. When the guy that really has a feel for the system comes in, you operate better. And they're going to see that. You're going to see a change in in touches for more of the guys and speed of the offense. It, it would be my guess. Right. And the other thing is they did they and this I get this a lot and I have my own thoughts. And I if if if, if there's a if once can't play, you put in Heineke, he gives you the best chance to win right now. They did draft a rookie in Sam Howell, and there are a lot of Howell, Howellians out there who want him to play. If you're a veteran and you see, like, you know, because I know a fans think, oh, they're two and four, they're not going anywhere. Coaches and players don't feel like that at this point, right? They're not going to say, oh, the season's over because we struggled early. But what, so what would be the danger of putting in a guy like Howell? And I know you're not familiar with them and, and all that, but the danger of putting in a guy, fifth round pick, hasn't played, et cetera. Or what would you think of that? Uh, well, first of all, you it's its hard to really say this, but in the uh, it's not hard to say this. Um, point blank, we're all independent contractors, and having a better year helps us individually. 
there's no end of the year at two and four. Nobody, if you're going to be a free agent or you're whatever, you're not going to decrease your own value because you're tired of a season at two and four. Right. You go play. Everyone's out to play for themselves. It's a lot of fun and it's exciting to win as a team. And for me, especially you get into year three, four, five, and you really start to develop a love of that team, that organization, the fans that surround that team. And there's more of a commitment to winning for your team, but it's not high school football or to some extent, not even college football where it's dire. You feel that dire need to win week in week out. And I'd be lying if I told you there were games that I played really well and we lost that I wasn't was pleased with myself, but you know, you know that there's, I still won some of those games personally. Right. Well, cause Wait, it, you we lost, lost, it's about value. and I think I had 10 or 11 catches and a hundred yards and a touch. Like you go home, you go, let's score a touchdown on Lambeau field and had a hundred yards receiving. And yeah, we, I would like to have won too, but in the same hand, there were games that we won that I didn't play well and I was frustrated. So that didn't happen in high school. You, you won and you were, that was it. So I, I don't think that you get to that point. Uh, there's a ton of pressure from the, from the outside for a lot of these players, not just with Ron and potentially what would happen with Ron uh, and with what's going on with the owner. And everyone feels that. Uh, it would be hard not to feel that. But you still, you go in, you show up, and the day of work starts, and you're involved in, in that. I'm, and for the coaches as well, like, right now you're not just going to put in Howell to, to develop a guy to see because maybe he's there next year. I think they need to win games. I, I think yeah. that having a four-win season really puts the head coach's job in jeopardy. I, oh, I don't yeah. have any clue what's going on with the inner workings of that, but a third year of not winning a lot of football games and – and not having your guy as a quarterback and not figuring out some things you need to figure out is not really good for head coach. No. Now that said, you get to you get to week twelve. I think they'd be okay to see where Al was if they knew where they're out of the playoffs. I, I think at that point you're not diminishing other guys' seasons and giving other you're not taking opportunities from from a lot of your team, and you're seeing what a quarterback could potentially be in the future. But I, I mean. Honestly, the other thing you look at, and I know this is a big class of quarterbacks coming out, and potentially this is a year that they, at the end of the year, that they draft one with Carson on a one-year deal. But you do, to some extent, need to figure out if Carson Wentz can figure it out. Right. Uh, at one point, he was one of the top 15, top 10 quarterbacks in the league. It's a brief. But is that guy still there somewhere? And can he evolve to be a little bit different than he was, but still that guy? That's yeah, something got to look at. The, the problem with that is, is it's so funny on a one year deal. If he does become that, then what do you pay him? Well, you know? he actually has, he does have a couple more years. It's just that there's no guaranteed money. Right. So they can move on after this year. So with no cap penalty, they can move on. Um, so there, you know, he is signed, but it's a, but if you don't, if it doesn't go well and, and a new staff comes in, they're cutting him without any problem. I understand. But if yeah. Carson went really well, he's going to want a new deal. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and yeah, and I think they would like, if he showed at the end of the year, if he gets really hot and they do well, I could see them doing something. Um, but you're right. I think the hard part too with how is if he could see week 12 and they put him out, out there and that's fine. It probably could be a new staff coming in and you probably, you may have a top 10 pick. And so you're going to go get another quarterback anyway. So, you know, unless he is somehow lights out, but the um, other thing, Al time is you, <laughs> It's not really fair to put a later round draft pick quarterback in if he's not ready to go in. It's not right. fair to him, right. you know. And, and have a better. Feel I don't know should, if he is or isn't. Yeah, they'll they'll they should have a better feel for could he really execute a game plan, and can he operate, or is he going to end his career essentially in the first year? And, be, and I don't know. I don't know where he's at with that, and that's something we'll find out a little bit more this week. Um, also, when you look at this offense, and, and I talked about this with you a little bit on the phone, but there was a play against the Bears, and it's just one of those plays where I'm like, I don't understand why somebody can't 
attack this area when and it was the blitz. It was that first blitz. It was like a third and six or seven. Essentially, there's three. It's a three receiver route, and there's three defensive backs, but they're all behind the sticks. So the blitz comes, and the middle of the field is wide open, and you have McLaurin and, and Samuel in the stack, and nobody's attacking the middle. Like nothing is broken off to account for a blitz coming, et cetera. I don't, I'll be honest, I don't get, and that's something I want to find out, ask more about this week. And I've been harping on this because the middle of the field is wide open. It's an easy first down if somebody just breaks off their route, if they have the freedom to break off that route. So do you remember that play? And what, you know, why do some offenses use hots and some not? Well, some offenses use hots because they don't have built-in answers for imminent pressure, pressure that they can't block. And I think that particular play earlier in the game where Smith comes through is is a zero blitz. It's all-out blitz, which means they're bringing one more than you can protect with because you can't protect with the quarterback. And Washington's in a max protect situation where they – where they struggle on this and where they're struggling with a lot of these is when you're in that max pressure situation, you can't give up a or B gap pressure. You can't give up immediate interior pressure. You're asking your quarterback to potentially drift right or left from one side or the other, where he knows he's not protected to get a ball out. You know, it, you want that pressure to come from the edge rusher. And then you see a quarterback start to move. If, it, if it's off his left edge, he'll start to drift, right, drift, right, drift, make the throw. But, He's not able to do that because they can't pass off the interior stunt and blitz. And between, I think it's between the center and guard, right? Yeah. Where Smith, comes. Yeah. he essentially goes unblocked. And you really, they've struggled all year to pass off some of those blitzes and stunts and to communicate as an offensive line. And there's a lot of different ways offensive lines do this. Um, there's a lot of different calls that are made. But what right now, Washington's struggling with it. They're sticking on their guy too long, you know, and a guard's. Got to detackle and and maybe they man it up and maybe it was a back and that missed Roquan Smith or you know maybe there's some other error but there's got to they have to stop having some of these errors you know they if they want to give Carson Wentz a chance you, you can't have immediate A or B gap pressure that's that's a dead play as far as the hots go I'm, you like I said a lot of offenses will have built in hots uh I even like I remember a meeting with Kyle Shanahan or a couple where we had, there's a certain play that we used to come back as a built-in hot. I mean, that's an 18 yard comeback, but it's, it's like lead him downhill to the sideline. And if it's incomplete, you survive a bad play. If that's the only answer we have on this, that's the only answer, but it, it's built in that they're throwing that. I'm not exactly sure how that's functioning for Washington. It doesn't seem like they have any red seven hot routes you know it's it's tough but to that particular play you know they are bringing one more than you can right. protect so you are in a you are in a hot situation you you have a free rusher because you cannot block you know eight with seven it's just not gonna happen and and even if you let your back get out on like they'll peel their pressures if you're back in tight end re release. They're manned up to bring to see that pressure if if they want to come off of it. But uh, I mean, if your quarterback really sees it, and there were guys that would do this. I mean, I remember Brunel all the time. We'd get to the line or close to the line. He'd say, "Hey, if it's all out here, or whatever, like just look at me, right? Just fine." Or hey, like if you got Samuel in the slot, I, I would literally yell "Red Seven at." Like it's a joke from Wedding Crashers, but literally, yo, 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 <laughs> yeah, just be, yeah. quick, like, be quick on this. Because really, the amount of time it takes a receiver to run a 10-yard a out route with the quarterback throwing it right before he comes out of that break is, is usually enough time to get the ball out. I mean, that's one second. If he can take that ball, hold it, just really rock, hitch rock, drift a little, it, the ball can come out. So to throw something like that. Do you think that's as much on Wentz maybe getting used to these receivers and them getting comfortable, or is that as much on 
and it may and again this is this may require more inside information but like is that as much as a built-in function of the offense well i think that it's that for play in particular is is probably more of a function of the protection breaking down immediately because Rokon Smith is is right. is going to be one of like the way we always did this too is it, when you had these zero pressures is you had a list of numbers that are must block numbers and then we always had a list of numbers your offensive line has a list of numbers like 98 93 95 91 52 those are the lists we're always going to take care of those guys first and then the backs would re be responsible for you know 37 48 and you, the, you kind of eliminate through a process pretty game or through practice of of who what potentials you have as far as blocking guys roquan smith is a must block there yeah and so they miss somewhere up front and it's hard to say always, you know, was the line in a full side right and your backside guard didn't slide? Or are they in a dual situation where they're going to post and then turn and pass it off? Are they in a full man situation? And that makes it tough with some of that stuff. I, I don't know. And it's, it's also a game, I, like I said, I was out of town and I've been watching the All-22. It's also tough to tell when you're watching a live game on television where exactly that broke down and missed. Right, 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 right. And, you know, and, and you know, I always hear about, like, providing answers for the quarterback. How were some of the other coaches, I think you brought up Jim Zorn with some answer, or answers or non-answers um, for quarterbacks? Well, I, I I did bring up some of the blitz meetings with Zorn, and I think it was interesting because – and I don't want to really – there were some confusion moments in meetings with protections and how it was handled, and I think – the other thing I don't want to do is because Joe Bugle was the offensive line coach at that time. And Bugs really did know how to pick up a lot of the things. And Bugs answered a lot of the situation was a lot with Joe Gibbs where we're going to max protect. And Zorn didn't want to max protect in a lot of those deals. And so I think figuring out how to pick some of the stuff up was maybe not agreed completely upon or was confusion between Bugs had one answer and, and was going to coach it one way, but Zorn changed it. It just, if everybody's not on the same page and there's not resolution to what we're going to do with pressure, then you're in trouble. And you have to practice a lot of these pressures and you have to practice a lot of these looks week in and week out and practice. And, and they do. I'm sure they have a blitz pickup period and right. work on a lot of that stuff. The, the other thing that I always, you know, Mike did this and I thought this was really good. And a couple coaches I've been around did some of these things where you got a you know, uh, four minutes at the end of practice with exotic pressures that you hadn't seen. Or your defense is going to bring whatever pressures they're going to bring that week. And we're going to use our protection to pick up their pressures. Obviously, we didn't game plan for our own defense. So now you have their all outs versus your protections and how you're going to handle it. And so you really have to communicate because you can watch as much film as you want. Everyone's going to change their pressures the next week. La last thing then, with when you're looking at Again, you're from coming from the outside. But when you look at a situation, you've been in situations where you've won, you've been in where they've lost, and you start tough starts, better starts, et cetera. What kind of things do you look for to see, like, could a team get out of this? And when you look at these guys, you're like, because, again, there have been a couple of years, the last couple of years, they've looked terrible, and then suddenly they play better. So what little things do you see to say, well, they could do this because of that? Or is there is there hope here, or is there not hope? Well, there's – there's always hope and there were teams that I was on that probably didn't have as much hope as we would have thought as a team, but you don't necessarily always see that. I don't think they look at themselves as a bad football team. They played a couple games that would be, in my opinion, pretty bad football, including that Chicago, which was really not good football. So that's one of those ones. <laughs> yeah, there's hope. And it's funny because there's a couple different scenarios. Like Joe Gibbs would sit down and say, okay, here's what we have coming up. And at least the next four games, it wasn't always just win a game. It's, it's, it's next game. It was okay. If we can beat, you know, who, like if we could beat Chicago this week, then we have Dallas coming next week. That's a game that we could win. And we'll find a way to get back to, you know, 
three and four or four and four. And then this is exactly where we would be at four and four in our conference, in our division. And he would lay it out. And I, I think it, it's hard not to do that as a coach because that is one thing that you could say one game at a time as much as you want. The players know exactly where they stand and exactly what it is. There's that, but then, then there's also the Mike Shanahan. We're going to evaluate everybody at three and six, and right. it, and then you make a run, and it seemed like they were – I don't think Mike was quitting on a year when he said that. I still don't believe that he was quitting on a year. I, I think he probably misspoke just a little bit. But there's always hope for that. I, I think it's a little bit dimmer <laughs> when you look at the division – yeah, like Philly's definitely. unbelievable right now. Dallas is a really good ball club, and that you know they they played tough with Philly for a while. And New York's all of a sudden coming on, and yeah. New York's put some things. And you're looking around, going, "Okay, well, where are we fitting into this?" But right now, kind of with an extra game and an extra playoff team, two and four isn't the exact same two and four as it was five years ago or four years ago. Right, it's find a way to to get back to four and four and four or four and five and let's we got to grow as a team and we'll we'll make a run but we got to win a couple games right now like you got to find a way to win a couple games right now and they have a schedule that lends to winning some games here in the next stretch so done is not really where you'd go with it is Rivera's messaging confusing to you at times well I don't I'm I'm not in it the way you're in it. And so I I don't sure. sit and see a, it's the funny thing when you're not that close to a team is you hear what's been the problem, quarterback. Right. Yeah. And I wouldn't I would not say that Rivera's strong suit is messaging. He's not a he's not a wordsmith up there. And I don't think he always understands. Like, I think he knows a lot of the times exactly what he's saying and why he's saying it. Yeah. But I don't think he knows that nobody else hears it that way. Right. In, in a lot of ways, it's, on, it's, it's a lot like my wife and I talking about uh, what we're doing as far as building the new house. And I say fashions. She says, what? Um, that's actually not true. She knows what fashion is. But the, 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 a lot of times we're saying the same thing or we're agreeing on something, but we don't know how to. You know, we're, it's a different language to some extent. I think with Ron, in a lot of cases, he doesn't hear how it's perceived in another way. Maybe. So, wow. yeah, confusing would be a good answer for that. I, I think his intentions are are probably, I, I believe his intentions for his team are, are really good. And, I, and it seems like the guys do want to play for Ron. I wow. also... I also see a guy that gets frustrated a lot with the media when maybe he doesn't need to get his, like, I think he has different expectations. Like the media's out to get him sometimes. You're like, eh. I mean, yeah. They're just doing job asking the questions that they're supposed to ask. I mean, yeah. it, it, but move. And Scott Turner, any thoughts? Well, I think Scott's struggling right now. I've, I've, I'm not exactly sure though when you think about it, is he struggling to some extent with quarterback and what Carson Wentz can handle on his plate? Is he struggling with some creativity? He's really, they've really been limited as far as what they're doing offensively, especially in some of the third down passing situations. Um, a couple weeks ago against Philly with what they wanted to do to handle what was really a three, three defense that, you know, it looks like a three, four front, but it's just one backer and they didn't run the ball very much. But it's a lot of it's a lot of, of basic crossing concepts and shallow cross concepts and mesh concepts and a lot of it's hinging on you know some underneath guys getting open and everything for right now when the, when teams are playing them there's it's just too easy to pass off most of those concepts when that's what they're running and that's the consistent right. of what they're running there's an answer and the defense has an answer and you got to make it hard and you got to make it different to, different as a coordinator. The, and where I know it can be different is in that first game, you, you could tell that Turner spent some time in the offseason putting some things together. Like right. they came out first game against Jacksonville and they had seven or eight unique things that yeah. 
Turner hadn't really done and that you hadn't seen much of. And I'm surprised that he hasn't gone back to some of those things. Like a, a, a great example. Early in the Jacksonville game, they ran a diamond set to Carson Wentz's left, and they ran a couple crossers, and on the outside, Samuel runs a whip back under all of it. And it's – I haven't seen a diamond look since that week. No. I don't think I – I, I think that they haven't ran any diamond set since that week. So, you, you got to be better formationally to challenge defenses, especially when you're running the same type of plays and the same type of stuff. And – I just don't think there's enough variation with personnel group and formation to tell a defense we're, we're doing something different or expect something different. Yeah. That was also interesting. Like we had Joe Gibbs sure. had the most limited playbook of all time, but it looked different every week. Chris, you're, I got to get going. You're the best. I'm going to cut off on zoom. So I appreciate your time, man. Thank you very much. Thank you, Kai. Always a pleasure, buddy. That's it for this episode. Thanks to Chris for joining me. And thank you, as always, for listening. I will be back on Thursday talking to ESPN Packers reporter Rob Domofsky. Yes, there's a game on Sunday. And yes, it still matters. So please tune in. Do me a favor and do that for your boy. I will talk to you next time.